first hears the words Gen Z, their immediate thought is probably someone who spends all of their time on social media, is self-centered, and doesn't really know anything about what's going on. In reality, none of that is true, except maybe sometimes the social media part. So today I'm going to go on a journey in explaining to you more about my generation and the stigma around it. Like, get outside. Do right. interesting stuff. Interact. You can't just stand here and TikTok. Put your phone away and not look at it constantly. To the right. They don't even know they're in the same room. That is amazing. And how many of you have kids that are actually begging you for a phone right now? You think we blame social media too much on problems? People are so addicted to these things, but they don't actually control their own life. Social media almost does. But now, former Facebook president Sean Parker is sounding the alarm about the potentially addictive nature of social media. Parker, who worked with Mark Zuckerberg to develop Facebook with a bombshell claim, saying the site was intentionally built to hook you. That thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. It's a social validation feedback loop because you're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. We understood this consciously and we did it anyway. <laughs> The company's leadership knows how to make Facebook and Instagram safer, but won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. With the dopamine spikes associated with seeing a like on social media, would children be susceptible to kind of seeking out that, that type of dopamine? Absolutely, you know, and particularly, you know, the adolescent and young adult age group. This is a very much a neurological phenomenon. It's not just a bad behavior. It's, you know, it's, it's not just a cultural uh, issue. It is truly a neurological phenomenon. There's a part of your brain that we call the pleasure and reward center. Neurons there, when they fire, they release dopamine, and that is experienced by people as pleasurable. Now the brain develops in these very orderly stages. That is, in adolescence, that pleasure and reward center fully mature uh, somewhere you know, in early adolescence, right? So that is sort of the gas pedal breaks and that is completely ready to go. Parts of the brain that are called the prefrontal cortexes, um, they mature later in late adolescence through early adulthood. The process is thought to finish somewhere around 25. So during adolescence, you've got the gas pedal like raring to go and the brakes aren't working yet, right? Really what they're developmentally geared for is activities or behaviors that will give them big spikes in dopamine release in the pleasure and the reward center. So addictive substances, they can directly stimulate dopamine release in the pleasure and reward center. So that systems that can hijack that, that, that all circumvent that, that normal pathway are going to give adolescents a real big bang for their buck and they're going to be attracted to that sort of thing. Like they changed the formulation of nicotine. It meant that they could have people take these bigger doses of, of nicotine with each inhale. And that is actually, I think, the same story that we're seeing with you know, these social media platforms, right? They're manipulating the algorithms to deliver this content that's very sticky, that really is gonna give these users repeated dopamine spikes, right? And so, you know, that's where that stuff is all happening under the hood. I think that in terms of regulation, that's where we should probably be looking, you know, when we're worried about addiction. My sense, including from documents that came out from the what were called the Facebook papers leaked by um, Francis Haugen, is that the companies do have internal internal data on this. And it shouldn't be surprising to us that these companies have data that suggests that uh, kids and adults as well will spend a lot of time looking at these platforms because that's kind of the 
the goal of these platforms, right? If you're um, uh, any social media platform, you're trying to maximize user time spent on the platform engaging with advertisements. It's very difficult to proactively, um, again, without without being pushed in a particular way by a, by a, a regulator or a legislator, to get them to proactively take steps that are going to diminish user engagement. We're seeing legislators in D.C. Um, really take on the platforms in a big way about their conduct curb that immunity somewhat to say you know, they're concerned that maybe it's it's gone too far. The second thing we're starting to see is litigation by plaintiffs and that says that the conduct we're worried about here is not the content that is uploaded by users, but is the platform's conduct itself. Their speech, I'm going after you for your algorithm, for your your ad targeting decisions, right? For your the bias baked into your platform. We had a couple of cases that went up to the U.S. Supreme Court this term against uh, Google and Twitter, both of which kind of punted on these issues in, in some ways. But I think we're going to see more efforts by users to say, look, you can't just claim 230 immunity. I think the bounds we can set through law and regulation are really, really important here. Social media companies rely on these traditional dispositionalist stories. They rely on the narrative that this generation is obsessed with their phones, disengaged with the world around them, and that the overuse of social media is a moral failing. As long as the dominant narrative is upheld, social media companies will continue to be insulated from liability. Addiction and behavioral use disorders are defined by a loss of control, and yet social media companies attribute this behavior to a set of preferences and desires expressed by an individual. The information available to these actors is not in balance. Large companies have the resources to conduct research and access to information about the way their products function. Despite this enormous informational inequity, consent is still wielded as a way to sidestep liability. The dominant narrative is, if you don't like it, you are free to stop using it, an individual's consent to the product's effects simply through their continued use. These stories of willpower, of control, of consent, obscure our perception of the culpability of these companies in creating a harmful product.